Genesis chapter number 1, we're going to read verse number 28. The Bible says, And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So this morning's sermon is going to be the first part of a series. And this is going to be a multi-part series I'm going to be preaching on the family. This may just be a, it may just be dual part. There may only be two particular, you know, uh, episodes or installments to it. But it is going to be a multi-part. There's a couple of sermons that I want to preach on the subject of the family, strengthening the Christian home, strengthening the family. The title of the sermon this morning is, Be Fruitful and Multiply. Be Fruitful and Multiply. So I want to start off by saying this. This is a very sensitive subject. Obviously, you know, this is a subject where there's a lot of debate. There's a lot of disagreement. But my job is to preach the Bible. Whether or not you get offended, whether or not you don't get offended, my job is to stand up here and preach what the Bible says. And if I don't preach on a subject because it may offend you, I'm not doing my job. My job is to, to preach the Word of God to you so that you are capable of making the right decisions in your life and, and helping you further understand what the Scriptures teach on this subject. There was a time in which where I studied this subject out and I had a different view of what I believe today. This was earlier on in my Christianity. I studied different sides of the equation and I actually fell on a, on the, a different side of where I stand on this now. This, this, uh, at that time, and I want to make this statement, when I had heard sermons from the opposing view... I distinctly remember being extremely offended by what I had heard. I distinctly remember, you know, feeling, you know, uh, 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 very offended and feeling, you know, very uh, disgruntled about the message that I had heard. But there was a time later on when I did the study for myself and I clearly saw what the Bible te taught on this subject. And I repented of that view or what I had thought that the Bible taught on that and I changed my position. So, what I want to tell everyone this morning is this. Whatever position that you have on this particular doctrine, make sure that it's not a position of convenience. Make sure that it's not a position of comfort. Make sure that it's not a position of maybe just what you were taught previously. Or maybe something that, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, that maybe is just compelled or influenced by our culture today and how people operate today. We are Christians. We need to go to the Word of God to see how we are supposed to live our lives when it comes to any manner of, of subject or whatever, you know, area of life that it is. So I'm going to be preaching about, you know, uh, bringing forth children, how many children we should have. And particularly, I'm going to be focusing on shortly on the phrase, specifically that commandment and that phrase, be fruitful and multiply. Now, first off, I want to start off very broad and basic, both. I want you to go to Isaiah chapter number 7, verse number 14. Isaiah chapter number 7, verse number 14. <clears throat> now, I'm going to read to you from Matthew chapter number 1, verse number 23. This first statement, I'm sure everyone would agree with, abortion is murder. Abortion is murder. The Bible teaches that life begins at conception. The Bible teaches that life begins at conception. Matthew chapter number 1 verse number 23 is quoting Isaiah 7 14 and it says this, Behold a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and, and shall call his name Emmanuel and so forth and so forth. I want to focus on that phrase in Matthew 1 23 that says this, Behold a virgin shall be with child. That's actually quoting Isaiah 7 14 and the Bible says this in Isaiah 7 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. So I want you to notice in Isaiah chapter number 7 verse number 14 it says, it makes the statement, Behold, a virgin shall conceive. That exact uh, uh, you know, phrase is quoted in the New Testament, of course under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And it tells you that a virgin shall be with child. So do you know what happens at the moment of conception? A child is brought about. A life is brought about. Conceiving is the moment where life begins, where a child comes into existence. That is where life begins according to the Bible. Therefore, if that life is terminated by any means from the point of conception, from the point of the child being brought into this world in that sense, right? That is murder. If that life is purposely terminated, that is murder. Now, of course, the obvious example of this is abortion. 
You know, it's very clearly murder. I'm sure everyone here would agree with that. You know, that, that, that's very plain. That's very obvious. The, the other point that I want to make, though, that not a lot of people are aware of is that birth control pills, birth control pills, which are commonly taken today, Baptists will take them. You know, you know the church that I grew up into, I know that uh, there, were, there were ladies in the church, you know, married women, of course, that were on birth control pills. There are methods, and actually most, if you will, most birth control methods and pills that are uh, available at stores today in the United States of America. A lot of people don't know this, but they actually cause early abortions and silent abortions. Abortions. I want to go over a couple of ways in which that this takes place that people are not aware of it. So there are three basic methods of birth control pills and the way that they operate. They use different types of hormones and stuff like that and actually the way that they, they work. Now, two of the ways do not cause, uh, just these two methods that is, they do not cause uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, an abortion, if you will. They do not terminate uh, you know, a life. The first two ways, number one, is that it prevents the uh, seed from fertilizing the egg. That is one way, obviously. If the seed has not you know, penetrated the egg or fertilized the egg, no life has been brought about. That is the definition of conception. We would all agree with that. When the seed penetrates the egg. That is the moment of conception. That is when life begins. right? And, and at that moment, scientifically, they know that that's when it starts multiplying and growing. It's clearly life, obviously. The, Bi the Bible has great science in it. Uh, so that right there, obviously that's not, that method is not murder. When, you know, if it just prevents the, the seed from penetrating the egg, that is not, of course, terminating, you know, a, a life or a child in that sense. So number two, the other way is that it, it causes the woman just to not release eggs. So if there's no egg, obviously there is no egg that can be penetrated. Therefore, you know, the seed cannot, you know, uh, conceive within the egg. So that is the other method, right? The third method, and this is the most common that is used, and I'm going to get into how the birth control pills work just very briefly. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. The third method is actually where it terminates the life. What happens is the, you know, the, the, the seed finds an egg that it penetrates or that it fertilizes. And at that point, obviously, if you're aware of how the process works scientifically, the egg then travels up the fallopian tube and then it makes its way to the uterus. When it gets into the uterus, you know, uh, you know, if you're familiar with the, the, the embryonic sac and everything, it's connected to the uterine wall. So that egg tries to attach itself to the uterine wall within the uterus. What these birth control pills do is they cause hormones to be released and it creates a hostile environment within the uterus that prevents the egg from attaching itself inside of the uterine wall. You know what it's doing is it's killing off that life and not allowing it to implant itself inside of the uterus. That's why it's hostile. It's basically, you know, in a sense, this isn't exactly right, but it's basically poisoning the life. It's killing off the life. It's causing a hostile environment where it's not able to survive. It is living. That's why they have to, you know, they have to step in and intervene with this life and, and they terminate the life. That is, that is murder. There are a lot of birth control pills that operate this way. That is murder according to the Bible because are we Bible believers this morning? Amen? We're Bible believers, right? Okay, well, if you're a Bible believer, then according to Matthew chapter number 1, verse number 23, and Isaiah 7, 14, when does life begin? The moment of conception. When is conception? When the seed penetrates the egg. So you agree that that is a living child according to the Bible. That is a child. So if that egg is purposely prevented by a person that has engineered this method to literally terminate that life, what did he do? What did that person do? They took part in murder. And obviously, the, you know, the, the, the woman that would be taking these pills would be doing it as well. Unawares, oftentimes, it's inadvertently, they're not aware that that is what they are doing. Uh, it would be, you know, like a, a form of manslaughter. It's obviously not the same as first degree murder, but even still, it's, it is murder. It's killing a human life, a child according to the Bible. Now, if you weren't aware of that, now you are. So now, if you go forth and you do that anyways, that is first degree murder. That is murder. First degree manslaughter. So this is what the Bible teaches. This is what we believe. We believe the Bible word for word. We believe it literally. We believe what the Bible says. Birth control pills are, they come in, they come in different, you know, uh, 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 different types of, oh, I mentioned the three methods. Let me do this. So I mentioned the three methods. 
There are types of pills that you can buy that only do the last method that I just mentioned where it just creates the hostile environment and doesn't allow the conceived life to survive within the uterus. That exists. There are also some types that primarily use the, uh, the type that stops the, the, the female from, the, it will prevent the, the, their ovaries from releasing eggs. Oftentimes, that particular method has a redundancy. And do you know what it is? Just in case your body does release eggs, because it's not, it's, you know, it's like, you know, 90-something uh, percent accurate, they'll tell you that. So sometimes it won't work and your body, you know, the female, uh, uh, you know, anatomy won't uh, react to it the right way and you will release eggs. And you've heard of people being on birth control and, you know, and coming up pregnant, right? Well, what will happen is their body will release eggs, but some birth control that you can buy will have as a redundancy the second method, and that was the, or the last method that I mentioned, where then it will, as a redundancy, it will then create a hostile environment. So a lot of birth control pills, that's what it does. It has this dual method where it will do both, and it'll have the backup, just in case it does take place, you know, and then that, of course, is murder. And then, you know, the, 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 uh, the one that is the least common, the least popular that you can find birth control pills is the one that actually prevents the seed from penetrating the egg. I would assume that that's more difficult to do scientifically. I'm not, I'm not aware of you know, how it all works. But the majority of them all contain the last method, whether you are aware of that or not. The majority of them all contain the last method. So for if many, many years that, that a woman was on birth control pills, she may not have been aware of this, but there were seeds that were penetrating the egg and that backup method kicked in and there were conceived, there was conceived life at points that died off. So if you weren't aware of that, you know, uh, I, stay away from birth control pills. That's one reason why we should stay away from them. Number one is because the, the conceived seed is life. You know, the, the seed, when the seed has conceived within the egg, that is life. And obviously we, we disagree with murder according to the Bible. So that's number one why a woman should stay off her birth control pills. Number two is you know, even if you found a form of it, there, of, of the, the birth control pills that, that uh, did not create the hostile environment, but it was just preventing, you know, from fertilizing or it was just preventing from releasing eggs, it's still terrible for your health. They will tell you if you read the packaging that there are chemicals in it that have carcinogens in them, that they are, they cause cancer, right? So it's terrible for your health. It's, it's poison, it's not only poisoning obviously this, this life, it has to kill off life and you're obviously alive so what do you think it's doing to your insides? It's obviously not helping you, you know, it, it, it's not a controlled environment. So it's obviously hurting you, it's harming you, that's why they tell you to wait after you get off the birth control pill because you, it's possible you might have a miscarriage because your uh, uterus has to reacclimate to its healthy conditions. It takes a little while to get off of that. So it's not good for your health, number two. And then number three, because women uh, will go through these side effects of birth control, oftentimes they, they you know, I, I actually have a very close family member to me that had two or three miscarriages at two to three months or three to four months, something later on in their lives, uh, the baby that is. And the reason why was because they were on birth control for probably 10 to 15 years not having any children. They had children when they were very young. A few years went by and they really wanted to have kids. But you know why it was so difficult? They did end up having another baby, but do you know why it was so difficult? Because their body, her body had been, you know, uh, wrecked from the, her uterus being, you know, uh, being created uh, to be a hostile environment over all this amount of time. So you know what ended up happening? Inadvertently, she, by taking those birth control pills, ended up causing those miscarriages. And this is very common when women are on birth control for many years, they will end up having miscarriages thereafter. Of course, that's a living being. That's what the Bible teaches. Those are, because of this you know, uh, 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 choice of, of consuming the birth control pills and getting on this particular method, those are living beings that, that, that died because of that. Does that sound like a good choice to make in our lives as Christians? Of course not. So birth control pills, obviously, as Christians, I believe that we should all stay away from them. But th this is actually going to be the focus of the sermon. Furthermore, the final reason why 
the final reason why we as Christians should stay away from any form of birth control, but also contraceptives, is because we as Christians are commanded to be fruitful and multiply. What I'm going to be doing this morning for you is going to be a very different sermon on this subject. And I'm going to show you things that I'm, po I'm positive you've never seen before. I'm going to be defining for you the phrase, be fruitful and multiply. This is where the disagreement and this is where the argument will come in on you know, everybody has the questions, how many children should I have? How long should I have the children? I'm going to be showing you from the Bible what the Bible means, number one. What is the definition of be fruitful and multiply? Numerous times. Number two, I'm going to be showing you the purpose of the phrase and the commandment. I'm going to show you why God says be fruitful and multiply. And then I'm going to get to point number three of what I'm going to be doing in the sermon later. I want you to uh, go back to Genesis chapter number one, verse number 28. Genesis chapter number one, verse number 28. <clears throat> Genesis chapter number one, verse number 28. So this is where we find the commandment to mankind to be fruitful and multiply. Genesis chapter number one, verse number 28 says this, And God blessed them. And said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So we're going to see these points over and over and over again. Number one, what is the purpose of, here from Genesis chapter 1 verse 28, to be fruitful and multiply? It is to replenish the earth. That is the purpose of the commandment that is given to mankind. Now this is going to help us answer the question on how many children should we have? What does the Bible mean? Should I just continually or perpetually be having children? And notice that the purpose of the commandment, it is part and parcel with replenish the earth. Replenish the earth. What does that mean? It means to fill the earth. And I'm going to give you the definition. I know there's been disagreement about, hey, what does replenish mean? And I wish I would have had this. I actually just found this the other day of what the definition of uh, uh, the word replenish is according to the Bible. I want you to look at Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 22 now. Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 22 says this, And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, now look at this, and fill the waters. Do you know what the definition of the word replenish is? It means to fill. Some people say, well, does it mean to refill? And this is actually where people will get their false doctrine of the gap theory, saying that there was a pre-civilization. Well, if we use the Bible to define what the word replenish means, we see the exact same statement that's given to the animals, and what does the word replenish mean? The definition of the word replenish does not mean necessarily to refill. You know, people will get confused by the word re right there. But if we use the, the law of first mention, mention, according to the Bible, the definition of replenish means to fill. When we see the exact same commandment given. If you look this up in uh, the Noah's Webster's Dictionary, they even define it as fill. It does not have to mean to refill or to do again, right? So... Notice there that replenish means to fill the earth. So what is the purpose when God blesses the animals? When God blesses the animals and he says, hey, be fruitful and multiply, what commandment does he also give with that? Fill the earth. Fill the earth. Now, if I ask you this question, how, how many children or how much offspring is God telling the animals to have? How often is he telling them to reproduce or to procreate? How many, how many, how many uh, you know, of the offspring does God commanding them to have? Well, what's the objective of the commandment? What's the goal of the commandment in this case? It's obviously to continually bring forth offspring. It's the purpose of the commandment is to fill the earth. It is to replenish the earth. Be fruitful and multiply. Replenish the earth or fill the earth. So there we find what is the objective or what is the goal of the commandment when it is originally given, when it is given for the very first time. Now I want you to go with me to Genesis chapter number 9, verse number 1. So what we're going to be doing is this commandment is given all throughout the Bible. We're going to be walking through the book of Genesis and on into the book of Exodus and also Deuteronomy following this commandment when it's given. Because many people will say, hey, well, that's just a commandment for Adam and Eve. That's not true. That is a commandment that is given to Adam and Eve, but this commandment passes down to mankind and it is repeated to Christians many years later. We're going to look right now, we're going to see in Genesis 9 where God says it to Noah when he gets off the ark. Obviously, it's more relevant when there's no one on the earth. There's nobody here. Of course, he's going to say, 
be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth because nobody's here. But it's still relevant even to those that are living later when the earth is becoming more and more populated. The purpose of the commandment is to fill the earth. It's to replenish the earth. The same exact commandment when it's given to the, to the animals is coupled with fill the earth. When the commandment's given to mankind, it's coupled with replenish the earth. Fill the earth is what that means. Isaiah chapter number 45 verse number 18 says this, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, <clears throat> God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. What is the purpose of God creating the earth? So he created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. God desires, and when he created the earth, he wanted people to live everywhere. Earth, you know, most of the time will refer to dry land. Even if it's not, obviously, it's, you know, where there is dry land, God formed it to be inhabited. People are like, oh, you know, we're so concerned about overpopulation. God formed it to be inhabited. If you're a Bible believer, God formed it to be inhabited. He wants people living everywhere. I'm not concerned about, you know, overpopulation. You know why? Because God formed it to be inhabited. I have faith in the Word of God. I believe in the King James Bible. When God says that, I believe Him. I trust Him. He's the creator of the earth. Right? So God formed it to be inhabited. It says, I am the Lord and there is none else. Isaiah 45, 18. Look at Genesis chapter number 9. Let me turn over and get there myself. Genesis chapter number 9. <clears throat> Genesis chapter number 9. Verse number 1, we see the exact same commandment again. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So we see the exact same command that is given to Noah. Now I also want you to see that the exact same command is again given to the animals. And we're going to learn more and more by comparing these. I want you to look at <clears throat> back at chapter 8 verse Number 17, we'll look at verse 15 first. And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now I want you to watch this very carefully. That they may breed abundantly in the earth. Now look and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. So the same command is given to Noah and that same command is given to the animals at that time. Well, that command was also given to Adam. And it was also given to the animals, right? And you'll see it, it, it tells them to replenish when we saw that with Noah. Coupling that and connecting that, of course, with Genesis 1. You know, very similar commands, very similar environment. You know, it's a very low population at this time. And he commands them to be fruitful and multiply. But I want you to notice what's coupled with be fruitful and multiply. Then I'm going to demonstrate this repeatedly, that the definition of be fruitful and multiply is to bring forth abundantly. That is the definition of the phrase, be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly. Look at verse number 17. It says that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful. And then it says this, and multiply upon the earth. I want you to go to Genesis chapter number 9, and we're going to look at verse number 7. The definition of breed is normally referring to animals, and it says mate and then produce offspring. It doesn't, all, it doesn't, of course, have to refer to animals. There were other definitions, but I wanted to read this to you. The synonyms are this. Reproduce, procreate, multiply. That is the third sentiment, synonym, not cinnamon, synonym that is used for the word to breed. And you know what it is? Multiply. He's using those two interchangeable when he says breed abundantly, multiply in the earth. You know what God wants you to do? He wants you to breed abundantly. Do you know what the word abundant means? A bunch. They, these words are, 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 are uh, actually related to one another. And, you know, oftentimes you'll see words where the A will become separated, right, in a word. And you'll, you will still keep that, you know, uh, that A with it. It's kind of like the word a lot, right? A lot of something, you know, so, uh, but like an allotment. But when we say a lot, it, it, people oftentimes will put the A with the, with the L-O-T, but that's actually not the correct way to spell that. You know, it's, it's supposed to be A space L-O-T, but it did come from the word like allotment, right? The same thing come, goes with the word like a bunch. People will say a bunch. Well, there's supposed to be a space there, right? I have a bunch of that. You know, I have a, you know, a bundle, right? It comes from the word, as we see here, abundance. And what does abundance mean? If you have an abundance of something, you have a lot of it. Normally, in, a, in other contexts, you know what it means? I want you to think about this. In other contexts, you know what it means? I have more than I need. 
If you have an abundance of something and you look up that word in the Bible, it's saying you have more than you need. You have more than you can handle. That's oftentimes what the word abundance means in the Bible. Another definition, and we're going to see this in, in a minute, where it's used interchangeable with abundance, is exceedingly. What does exceeding mean? To exceed something means you have more than you, you need, more than you can handle. We are supposed to bring forth exceedingly, or we are supposed to bring forth abundantly uh, in the earth. Look at Genesis chapter number 9, verse number 7, just to prove that this same command is given to humans. This is very important. Genesis chapter number 9, verse number 7. Pay attention to this. And you, this is speaking to Noah, be ye fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. So notice that when comparing these two together, <clears throat> we see the command given to the animals and it says, it says to bring forth abundantly, right? To the animal specifically. And, and these are obviously clear parallels of the exact same commands. And I want you to also, in the back of your mind, you know, uh, I don't want this to become you know, discombobulated. I want you to keep in the back of your mind the purpose. And doesn't that make uh, a lot of sense that if the purpose is to fill the whole earth, is to inhabit the whole earth, that he would want them to bring forth abundantly or to bring forth as much as they can, to have as many offspring as they can, if the purpose is to fill the earth. Of course, you would want them to bring forth abundantly, to have a bunch. Now we see the command actually given to Noah. And we see the phrase, be fruitful and multiply, being defined. Do you know what it means? To bring forth abundantly. To have a bunch of kids. Now, also, and I'm going to hit this a little bit later as well, this command is not only given to Noah's children. Noah's not a young man. Noah is also commanded at this time, later in his life, along with his children, to bring forth abundantly. This command was given to all of them. He actually speaking sp specifically to Noah, if you look at it, God spake unto Noah. He didn't speak to his children. He gave the command to Noah, but he's commanding all of them to bring forth abundantly. I want you to go with me now to <clears throat> Genesis chapter number 17, verse number 6. Genesis chapter number 17, verse number 6. A synonym of the word abundantly, if you look it up, is actually exceedingly, as I mentioned already. It's to have more than what you need in most contexts, more than what you can handle. You know? <clears throat> if somebody asked you, it's normally, you know when you use the word abundant, when you can't even count the number. If somebody asked you like, hey, how many of those do you have? Oh, I just, I have a bunch. I have abundant of them. Now, if you could tell them real easily, hey, I just have like four or five. Right? I have like five or six sitting back there in the storage. But a lot of times when you use the word abundant is when it's a lot, like a massive amount. Like, yeah, I have an abundant of those. I just have a bunch. Or the fact that you want to stress, like, it's a lot. It's a lot of them. Look at Genesis chapter number 17, verse number 6. Genesis chapter number 17, verse number 6 says this, And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. I want you to go to Genesis 17, 20. Genesis chapter number 17, verse number 20. So I wanted you just to notice there specifically that the word exceeding was coupled with fruitful. We saw abundant being used interchangeable with the word fruitful and multiplying and being fruitful. Look at chapter 17, verse number 20. We'll see exceeding used again. This is spoken to an individual. Because somebody should say, oh, well that's just talking about mankind in general. Or that was just to Adam and Eve. Well, this is many years later. We saw the command already given to Noah, right? So this totally debunks that. And this is actually about an individual bringing forth abundantly, being fruitful and multiplying, and having an exceeding amount of, of offspring or uh, propagating an exceeding amount of children. Look at Genesis chapter number 17, verse number 20 it is. Yes. I thought I had that wrong for a moment. Genesis chapter 17, verse number 20. And as for Ishmael... I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Now, I want you to notice what he... And he gives us a number here as well, so this is interesting. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. So notice right there what you see again is you see the word exceeding used. You see the word exceeding used, just like we saw the word abundant being used previously. These words are interchangeable. We saw abundant being used in the sense of being fruitful and multiply. What it meant was to breed abundantly, like it was told the animals, and then it said bring forth abundantly. We're actually given a number here, and this is interesting, of what the definition of, like, hey, let me get a count. Now, let me say this before I go any further. Is there a specific amount of children that you should have to fulfill this commandment? 
So I want to make that statement first. Of course not, because not everyone is going to have the same amount of children. Every, it doesn't matter that if, 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 if you did an experiment with five people and they got married at the exact same age, they were all, you know, uh, had the exact same amount of time to have their children, and they tried to follow the same exact cycle and pattern, they would not have the same amount of children. They would not have the same amount of children. I, you know, there, are there exceptions in some cases? Yes. But by and large, if you look at the average amount where people have done studies where people will just have as many children as they can, the average amount of children that a family will have or a couple have is six. That's the average. Now, of course, some women are totally barren. Some women will only have around five or six, and some women will have 12, 14, you know, higher numbers. Now, what is the number that's given here when he actually says, I'm going to make you fruitful and multiply? So before he just tells us, hey, be fruitful and multiply, what's the number that's given here when it says, I'm going to make Ishmael fruitful and I'm going to multiply him? How many children does he have? Twelve. Twelve children. Now, that specific number, obviously, a lot of people are like, whoa, twelve children, right? In the world that we live in today. That specific number, does it sound like they're like, you know, trying to limit the amount of kids that they have? If we look at the amount of time that you have to have children, right, as, as women, we look at the amount of time when, when people normally get married and when they stop having children, you, know, you don't have much, you don't have the capability to have much more than 12 or 14 children. And that's getting married and beginning to have children at the age of 20, 18. If you add that up, that's going to put you right at the time when a woman is no longer capable of bringing forth children. So here in this case, when he says, I'm going to make him fruitful and multiply him, in that case, the numbers given, what do we see? 12. Abraham, do you know how many children Abraham had total? What would you say? 13. Maybe I'm missing a number. Where did you get that? No, Abraham. That's why. Not Jacob. Abraham. Abraham had eight kids. Abraham had eight children. This, I remember this, and this made it easier. I don't know why I remember random numbers like this, but I remembered when he married Keturah. I think I know why, because I'll tell you what sticks out in my mind. He had six children with Keturah. That always stuck out with me, because with, yeah, obviously he had so much trouble with Sarah having a child. Now I want you to think he had six children with Keturah. How many did he have with Sarah? One. How many did he have with Hagar? One. In his old age, after Sarah died and Hagar isn't mentioned any longer, even in his old age, he brought forth six children. Does it sound like when we look at Noah still receiving the commandment of being hundreds of years old? Right? So that's no excuse if you're 100. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, if we look at how old Noah was when he still received the commandment along with his sons, it sounds like God still wanted him, if capable, to bring forth children. We look at Abraham. What did Abraham practice? He was 99 when his first son, well, yeah, well his second son, when he conceived the second son. Right? Because Hagar, of course, and all that took place before that. 99 years old when his first child was born. His very first child with Sarah when she was past the, the ability, past the age, right, of women. So he ended up having eight children. And when he ha had that relationship, the physical relationship with Katur, which he married after Sarah, he, does it sound like he was limiting the amount of children that he had? This is late in his life. He didn't have near as much time. And this is with one woman. He had six children with Katur. And Abraham had eight children. Imagine, think about this, my friend. Do you know how many children he would have had with Sarah if they would have been able to have children prior to that? Do you know how many children he would end up having, period? A lot. He had eight, and he had his first child with Sarah at 99. So think about how many kids he would have had prior to that. A lot of children, an abundance of children, when he ended up having eight, and six of them with Keturah, which he married many years after. Um... Go to, let's keep doing the, uh, I want to keep looking at the definition here. Uh, Genesis chapter number 28, verse number 3. Genesis chapter number 28, verse number 3. Brother Rick brought up a good point. Jacob had 13 children. Jacob ended up, ended up having 13 children. He had 12 kids, or, or 12 sons, which were the, the 12 tribes of Israel, and then he had one daughter. So if we look at Jacob as an example, he ended up having 13 children himself. There are many examples of people having, you know, uh, uh, numerous children in the Bible. Look at Genesis chapter number 28, verse number 3. I want, to, I want you to get the concept and the idea here repeatedly. 
of when we see people actually fulfilling the commandment, how many children they end up having, if we look at it logically, what practice are they actually taking part in? What is there? You know, uh, uh, what does the Bible say when they are fulfilling the amount of kids that they're having? What is the definition over and over again? And keep in mind, what, what was the purpose to fill the earth? Is the earth totally inhabited right now? Is the earth completely inhabited or is there a lot of room for you to have offspring? There's a lot more room. Do you know what God's will is? He formed it to be inhabited. He formed, so it, has that commandment fully in its sense for its purpose been fulfilled? No. Not if you take the Bible literally. He formed it to be inhabited. That's what God desires is for people to live on the earth. That was the reason why he gave the command. Look at Genesis 28, verse number 3. And God Almighty bless thee, and make thee fruitful, and multiply thee. Now watch this. That thou mayest be a multitude of people. What does be fruitful and multiply mean there? Be a multitude. It means to, an abundance. It means exceedingly. Notice these words used over and over again. Go to Genesis chapter number 48, verse number 4. Genesis chapter number 48, verse number 4. <clears throat> Genesis chapter number 48, verse number 4. <clears throat> and said unto me, Behold, <clears throat> I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee, and I will make of thee a multitude of people. So notice, what does it mean? It means to be a multitude. It means to be an abundance. It means to be exceeding. A multitude of people and will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. I want you to go back now to Genesis chapter number 46, verse number 27. Genesis chapter number 46, verse number 27. Genesis chapter number 46, verse number 27. And I, wanna, I wanted to do this math, but I didn't have an opportunity. I wanted to do it yesterday, but I didn't have, have an opportunity to actually get to it. <clears throat> Genesis chapter number 46, verse number 27 says this, it gives us a number here. It says, And the sons of jo Joseph, <coughs> excuse me, which were born him in Egypt were two souls. All the souls of the house of Jacob which came into Egypt were three score and ten. So we're told that 70 people went down into Egypt, correct? 70 people went down into Egypt at the time of, you know, when Joseph is there and his family needs protection at that time. They need uh, uh, food. And so he, they go down there and he says, I'll take care of you, right? They stay in Egypt for how many years specifically? Does anybody remember? What was the year, the amount of years until, until Israel was led out? Anybody? 430, exactly. To the day, it tells you. 430 to the day, it tells you. It's an interesting statement, right? Now, we're given a number of how many... This is the only number we're given of the whole population of Israel. If you go through and you add up all of the tribes, it gives you the number of all the able men that are able to go forth to war. And the total of all of the tribes of the men, when they are led out of Egypt, of the men that are able to go forth to war, is around 600,000 roughly. It's right around 600,000 if you add up each of the tribes. 600,000. Well, if you take that number and you average it out for the years that are given, so those that are able to go forth to war is 20 to 50. So if you average that number out and then use that average and plug in the numbers for the previous years, you know, 0 to 20, but then you also take that average because the Bible says that we're promised three score in 10 years. So let's just use 70, right? We also use that average from 50 to 70. You'll get a number of the amount of males. Well, if you look at any given society, do you know how many females there are in comparison to males? Well, exactly 50%. That would have to be. It would be a big problem, right? It's right around like, it'll be like 51, 49. It goes back and forth. But they're roughly 50% usually. So if you just take that number and you double it, do you know what you end up with? Around three and a half million. Three and a half million. So when they went down into Egypt, do you know how many people went down into Egypt? Do you remember? Seventy people. When they came up out of Egypt, after 430 years, do you know how many people were there? Three and a half million. Three and a half million. 430 years, if you break down the average of your average or, you know, the median of generations, normally people will use a number. Sometimes people use 25, sometimes people use like 40. But if you use like 30, the number 30, which is the, the difference between that, do you know how many generations you have? 
It's 12 generations. So in 12 generations, they grew from the population of 70 people to three and a half million. Now, I didn't have the opportunity to break the numbers down because it would be a little bit difficult to actually average from as close as you could possibly be from 70 to three and a half million and to see in each generation how that would come out exponentially because you'd have to break it down obviously it's growing exponentially but then you'd also have to break down with those two couples you understand what I'm saying what the average so you take the number that's left over and then average that out between each of those families so you'd have to count up the, you know, each generation how many were actually there and then kind of disperse that number between them evenly. But I'm sure everyone here gets the, gets the idea. I want you to go to Exodus chapter number 1. Exodus chapter number 1. I'm sure everyone here understands the concept that when <clears throat> the children of Israel went down into Egypt and they were in Egypt for 12 generations... They were able to, to be so fruitful and multiply, and we're going to see this in just a moment, that they completely outnumbered a dynasty. The, the nation of Egypt was an empire on the world at that time. And it came to the point where there were literally more Israelites. And they came in after the nation was founded and in place and there. And people were all, there was already a, a, a given population of, of Egyptians. It was, all, already, it was already a booming civilization where when people ran out of food, that's where they went. It was the larger city or the larger civilization. And people are well aware that it was an empire at that time. Well, 70 people moved into an empire. And within 12 generations, they literally, they outpopulated. They outgrew in numbers and outpopulated an empire. Does it sound like to you that the family's having two children apiece? Does it sound like to you that, the, that each family, on average, is even having three or four kids apiece? Of course not. Now, I, I really want to get the exact number, but they're having an abundance of children, like the Bible commands you. They're having an exceeding amount of children. I want you to look at Exodus chapter number 1, verse number 1. The Bible says this, Now these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. Every man in his household came in with Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, and Nephali, Gad, and Asher. And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were seventy souls, for jo Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. Now look at verse 7. And the children of Israel were fruitful, watch this, and increased abundantly. There's that word again. Increased abundantly, and multiplied, and watch this, and waxed exceeding mighty. That's talking about mighty in numbers, is what it's referring to. Notice exceeding, abundantly. Do you know what the definition of being fruitful and multiply is? Abundance. You wanna, if you ask me the question, well, how many kids should I have? You should have an abundance of children. That's what you should have according to the Bible. Do you know what it means to be fruitful and multiply? Now, does it sound like the children of Israel thought that that command was only to Adam? He actually tells you, this is the, the, the Holy Spirit writing this and, and, and narrating this. The Holy Spirit tells you that they are fulfilling this command. They were fruitful and they multiplied. They waxed exceeding mighty, it says. It says they increased abundantly. And, and being fruitful and multiplying is always a blessing. It says, and he blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. People today, when they, they think about being fruitful and multiplying, a lot of people are like, ah. They think it's like a curse, like it's the opposite. It's a blessing to have children. It's a blessing to have an abundance of kids. You know, children are a blessing from the Lord. They were being blessed. When the children of Israel were growing in numbers and increasing abundantly and all the families were having numerous amounts of children, do you know what God was doing for them? He was, a ble he was blessing them. Does it sound like... I want to ask you this question. Does it sound like they were limiting or trying to deter the amount of children that they were having? They're waxing exceeding mighty. They're, they're, they're increasing abundantly. Does it sound like they have a, a certain number picked out, like people will do? Hey, I want to have two. You know, so that we can keep them under control. One for you and one for me. Right? No, of course, what they're doing is they're, they're just having as many children as God allows them to. Do you think when, when, when God told Adam 
Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth, to fill the earth. Do you think Adam said, I think we'll have seven, honey. I think we'll have six kids. He understood the command. What's the purpose of the command? Replenish the earth. And they walked away and they said, what do you think, four would be good for us? Think four kids would be good? Think two would be good? The purpose of the commandment is to fill the earth. It's to replenish the earth. It's a blessing from God. That's what it is. So when you understand the purpose of the command, and you get the definition of replenish there too, it means to fill the earth. He formed it to be inhabited. That's what God desires. He created the earth for a purpose and for a reason. Right? Then we see over and over again the definition of it. And what does it mean? Breed forth abundantly. Let me ask you this question. Be consistent with your logic. When he commanded to the, to the animals, what do you think God's desire was? What was his purpose? What did he want them to do? He wanted them to breed abundantly. He wanted them to breed as much as they could. That's what he wanted. He wanted them to bring forth as much as he could. That's what he desired. Breed abundantly. Bring forth abundantly. Bring forth children. Be fruitful and multiply. Exodus chapter 1 verse number 7, notice it tells you they increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty. And I want you to look at this. Look at the fulfillment. And the land was filled with them. What's the purpose? Fill the land. Fill the earth. You think that's a coincidence? The Bible is so perfect. You know what they did? They inhabited the land that they were in. They filled the land with their You know what they did? They ended up, and if you're familiar with the story, they ended up, they were obviously outpacing the Egyptians so drastically that they ended up outnumbering them in a few generations. And, and they outnumbered them not only in the 12th generation prior to that, because the time period went on, you know, maybe 11th or 10th generation, whatever it was, obviously close. But time went on before this where when Moses... Moses was how old when he ended up leaving and, and going? 80 years old? So I want you to think about that. That's two generations additionally right there, number one. And they were trying to kill Moses when he was a baby. Because why? Because they had already outnumbered him. So that's three generations where they had already outnumbered an entire empire. Does it sound like the children of Israel have you know, some uh, selective breeding that they're doing on how many children they're having? We can see, and the Holy Spirit tells you they fulfilled it. You know what they did? They filled the land. They fulfilled the purpose and they were fruitful and multiplied. And you know what they did? You know what that means? To increase abundantly. To breed abundantly. And what did, um, what did the uh, Pharaoh do? I wanted to say Herod because you know the similarities. What did, what did Pharaoh do? He tried to limit the amount of children that they had. What is Egypt a picture of all throughout the Bible? The world. Egypt is a picture of the world. That's what Egypt is. You know what Egypt wanted to do? Do you know what the king wanted to do? You know who Pharaoh pictures perfectly? The devil. Satan. Talks about, you know, the dragon which is in the sea, right? And if you, you know, you look up that passage, it'll make uh, allusions to Pharaoh even, right? There's this strong parallel between Herod and Pharaoh. Herod tried to kill Jesus and all the babies at that time. Pharaoh tried to kill Moses and all the babies at that time. We get to Revelation chapter number 12. You know what it talks about? It talks about the dragon that's in the sea. And you know what he tries to do? He tries to kill all the babies. This was a picture of Herod and trying to kill Jesus. Moses being a picture of Jesus in so many ways. And it pictured the dragon, which is who? Satan. Do you know who doesn't want you to have children and to bring forth abundantly? The devil. Satan. Do you know who, who tries to discourage you from having as many kids? So you say, where did this come from of, of limiting the amount of children that I had? Where did it come from in Egypt? Did it come from God's people? Is this something that the Bible is preaching? You'll never find a single time in the Bible where, where God tells you to try to be careful on how many kids you have, to try to use a method to try to limit how many kids you have. You can't point me to a, a single passage one time. And here's the thing. The only time when somebody does it, he's killed. It's besides the point of what the purpose is. So you can say, hey, well, that doesn't prove that birth control is bad. It's besides the point. I already believed that before I'd ever even heard that argument. I've showed that to Brother Rick right when I got to Faithful Word. So before so-and-so came up with that argument, I already understood what the passage was teaching. I knew that, that Onan was killed because he, was, because he specifically prevented it so that he, because the seed wouldn't be his. That's besides the point, my friend. That's the only mention. 
and you don't have another mention. It's not like, oh, I have this one that's positive and this one that's negative. The only one that's negative, the only time that somebody does it, they're killed. So even if you want to ignore that, show me another passage where somebody limits the amount because I can show you the whole Bible where people have the, as many kids as they can have from beginning to end. They're having 12 kids, they're having 13 kids. The children of Israel are having like, it seems like 8, 9, 10 kids apiece and that's including people that are barren, that have zero children. So how many kids are the people having that can? You know what they're having? They're increasing abundantly. They're having as many children as they possibly can. They're just, they're just going the natural way of things. Just having children. That's what they're doing. That's what the commandment is. Be fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly. I want you to go to Deuteronomy chapter 1 now. Deuteronomy chapter number 1. Deuteronomy chapter number 1, verse number 11. The Bible says this. The Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times so many more as ye are and bless you as he hath promised you. You know what this is said? After they're out of Egypt. What's the population? Three and a half million. After they had already outpaced a dynasty. And do you know what a blessing was to the children of Israel? Make you a thousand times more. Does that imply the spirit of this type of blessing? That we should be limiting as God's people the amount of children that we should have. No. What does he desire? Make you a thousand times more. What's the point? Just multiply. Just bring forth abundantly. Just, just increase abundantly. Wax exceeding mighty. Isn't that a big blessing? If you do a thousand times more, I mean, goodness sakes. It's like, you know, in the billions. It'd be like three and a half billion. If you do a thousand times one thousand, you just add the zeros, it'd be exactly three and a half billion people. Three and a half billion of just the nation of Israel. And he said, that's a blessing. That's a blessing. You know what pace you were moving at before? You know what would be better? To times that by a thousand. That's the spirit of be fruitful and multiply. Next passage I want you to go to. We're working through these. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 11. We got one more. In the book of Deuteronomy after this. Deuteronomy chapter number 28 verse number 11. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter number 28 verse number 11. <clears throat> the Bible reads, And the Lord shall make thee plenteous. What does plenteous mean? Plenty. What is, what is uh, uh, a wor another word we'd use for plenty? Maybe exceeding or maybe abundantly or abundance or a bunch or a lot. Plenteous in goods in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy ground, in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, give thee. How much fruit do you think they wanted the trees to bear? Think about it. As much as it would. As much as it could. How many, how many, how many animals do you think that they wanted it to bring forth the fruit of? As many as it did. You think the cows are like, Mrs. Cow, Mr. Cow are like planning out their careers based upon how many children they're going to have? Hey, it's going to be a little bit difficult, you know, of finances when we get to this point in our life. You know, we should probably, that other child, you know, that other calf, we should hold off for a couple of years until you get out of college. Is that what they're doing? The point is that they're having as many as they can. So the same way in which he, he, he's blessing the people to bring forth the fruit of their bodies, the same way they're blessing the animals, blessing the, the land, blessing the fruit, bring forth plenty, bring forth abundantly. There's not a single time in the Bible where the Bible ever encourages you one time to ever, to ever try to limit the amount of children you have. You know what you're, you know what you're bombarded with every time? Have an abundance. Fill the earth. They filled the land. They were exceeding mighty. God bless them. Over and over and over and over again. So I want you to ask this question to yourself. Where's the influence coming from? Is it the Bible? Or is it Egypt? Who's influencing you on this? And why is it easy to accept? Go to Deuteronomy 30, 16. I'll read it to you. You go to Psalm 127. Deuteronomy 30, 16 says this. In that I command thee this day... To love the Lord thy God, to walk in His ways, and to keep His commandments, and His statutes, and His judgments. That thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. So notice, 
multiplying, blessing, every single time. Every time that you see the word multiply, bringing forth ab abundantly, breeding abundantly, uh, uh, you know, plenteous, over and over and over again, there's another word that you'll find usually. And what the pronouncement actually is, is a blessing. Whoops, I'm going too far. I'm thinking about two things at the same time. Psalm chapter number 127. Our world today thinks of children as being a burden. Thinks of children as being a curse. Thinks of children as, as you know, uh, they look down on families that have many children. And what kind of statements does everybody that has many children hear hear? What do you hear when you get out? I mean, all the time. I mean, at my job, you know, uh, people, will lo they love to joke about If my wife's pregnant or something, they love to joke about it and stuff like that. Man, you know, when, uh, I'll tell you something funny, when, when our boss was buying tickets to like a game for just, you know, a benefit, just helping out charitably, you know, giving back to the employees. He was buying tickets to, uh, it was a baseball game, but I couldn't go because it was on a Sunday. Uh, they were like, uh, he asked me and they were like, they were, he was asking about, you, uh, you, you going to be coming, you going to be coming? And then he came over and he's like, you're not going to make it, are you? Because it's on a Sunday. I was like, I'm not going to make it. One of the guys was in the crowd was like, yeah, you better be happy he ain't going. You know, obviously, because he's saying you're going to have to pay for eight tickets if I go, right? Or in that case, it'd be seven, right? But it will be eight soon. But pe what, what's the point? People all the time, when you go out, what do people say to you at the store? Like, man, you know, that's got to be hard to handle. Right? They, they make all types of what? The, you know, negative statements. You know, family members will, you know, try to, try to uh, influence you in not having children. People just in the world in general, it's just the influence that's coming from the world. They try to make it sound like it's a cursing. You need to have the, the Bible's state of mind. We need to, you know, uh, uh, we need to not be conformed to the world, but we need to transform our minds. What does the Bible say that having children is? The Bible says it's a blessing. When, when God gave them or, 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 or commanded Adam and Eve to have children, it says he blessed them. Having a child is a blessing. Being able for your wife, if she's still capable and able to have children, that's a blessing. It's a blessing to have children. Look at Psalm 27, verse number 3. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Saying it's a reward, it's something good that he has. Watch this though. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Do you know what his quiver is likened unto being? Full. Do you know what he did? He put as many arrows in there as he could. I want you to think about that. His quiver is full. There's as many arrows in the quiver that fit in the, in the quiver. He put as many in there as he could. They're full. Does that sound like he's got three or four arrows in there? That's not a coincidence. Happy is the man that hath... What's the point even? Even if you say, well, that doesn't mean you can have as many as you should. Obviously, it's saying his, his quiver's full. The point is to say, he's got an abundance. He's got a lot. He's got exceeding many arrows in that quiver, doesn't he? I mean, the quivers, of course, is what the arrows go in. You'll often see like Robin Hood. It's got the, you know, the strap that goes around his chest. His, his quiver's full. He has as many in there as he can. And what is it? It's a blessing. What does it say that he is? Happy. That man is happy. If you have as many children as you can or as you should, you should be happy because it's a blessing. Look at Psalm 28. Verse 1, Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. So this is talking about if you're, if you're a good man, you keep the commandments of the Lord, you follow the law of God. Look at verse 3. Thy wife, as a result of being a good man and keeping the commandments, shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children, watch this, like olive plants, round about thy table. What's the point of the passage? It's a blessing to have kids. You'll be happy if you have many kids. And then he says, it makes the statement like olive plants round about thy table. What's the point? There's many of them. There's an abundance of them. There's numerous of them. There's exceeding many of them. There's a lot of them. There's a bunch of them. I want you to go with me now to Luke chapter number 12 verse number 22. So now I'm going to get into some of the objections that people will always bring up about, you know, 
like, you know, about, hey, I, don't, I can't have that many kids because of this, or I can't have that many kids because of, what are the reasons why people say this? Now, before I get into that real super quickly, I want to say this. I want you to think about the significance of the blessing that you were blessed with. The significance of the ability of the blessing that Adam and Eve were giving. Think about the significance of bringing a human life into the world. A human life, a child and a being that has the ability to live and enjoy life. God gives you the ability of that. God gives you the ability to allow someone to live and enjoy life, to read the Bible, to grow up, to have relationships, to experience life. You have the ability to either choose to do that or not to do that. Isn't that pretty significant? That's a major, major blessing. And God hands that into your hands. He gives that over to you and entrusts you with that ability. So if when you stop and think about that significance, it's your decision on whether or not you can bring a life into this world. Obviously God gives it life, but God gave you the button to press, if you will. And you can either press that button, and, and there could be a child there, a living being there, or you can just step back and not press the button. At the end of your life, if you ended up having as many kids as, as you could, do you think that you'd look at your children and say, hey, Finances weren't that good at the end of our life. I wish we wouldn't have had those two. Get real. You'd have had as many as you could. You'd have had as many, as many children as were possible. That's what you would have done. Now, the first, the very first objection that people will bring up is this. They'll talk about, like I just mentioned, your finances. That's what people will talk about is your finances. Now, we as Christians live by faith. Amen. Not by sight. Amen. We live by faith, not by sight. I want you to look at Luke chapter number 12. And I want you to look with me at verse number 22. The Bible says this. <clears throat> and he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life what ye shall eat, neither for the body what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And, and which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least... Why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will, ye, will he clothe you? And then it says this, O ye of little faith. We're given a commandment. So first we start with the commandment. Be fruitful and multiply. And what does it mean? And when we, dis and we can see and come to the conclusion of what it means, we do that independently of the other subject of can my finances handle it. That's irrelevant to what the commandment is. That has nothing to do with what the commandment is. Because if the commandment is to bring forth abundantly like it is, to have as many children as you can, to be fruitful and multiply, that's irrelevant to what your finances are like. We keep God's commandments even if we, it doesn't look like we can. Even if it's difficult. Even if it's hard. We should follow God anyways. You should do what God has for you anyways. And if, if, you know, if you in your life are concerned about being fed, about being clothed, about being, you know, uh, 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 you know having the things that you need, about being taken care of, if you're concerned about those things and you make a decision based upon those things, you have little faith. The reason is because you have little faith. Because the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Do you know what you're doing? You're leaning on your own understanding. You're thinking, I don't think that I can take care of myself. If I, if I, don't, think, I don't know if I can take care of this child. We live in America for crying out loud in the first place. Eat rice and beans if it came down to that. Goodness sakes. That's what a lot of people in third world countries are. I would rather keep God's commandments and live in a hut and eat rice and beans the rest of my life. That's what I would rather do than live in some super nice house. That's what matters. I, I'm going to be 100% honest. I love you and I hope you do well in life, but I would, I would, I would stricken you with that situation if, as long as you're going to keep the commandments of God. 
That's what matters and that's what's important. So we start out with first, what does the commandment say? And, and anyway, first of all, you know what you need to do? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. God will provide for you. God will provide for you. Psalm chapter 37 verse 25 says this, I have been young, young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. That verse says what it says. And if somebody tries to say, well, what about this case? Or what about that case? Do you know what they have? Little faith. This verse is super clear. David says this. Read it with me again. I have been young and now am old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor the seed begging bread. So if someone's going to try to convince me that the righteous has been forsaken and that his seed is begging bread, I don't want to hear it because I believe God, not you. That's what this says. And oftentimes what people do, the types of people that want to just like, you know, logic everything out, they start leaning on their own logic or their own understanding instead of the Bible. That's what the Bible says. And, and righteous here, I don't specifically, number one, I don't believe that that is talking about just a saved man. I believe that it's talking about a man that's following the commandments in that sense. Because righteous is used like that sometimes. Because if you remember in Deuteronomy 28, do you know what that blessing is associated with? It's associated with keeping the law. That's what those blessings are associated with. Having food, having all of this, these things. If a man decides to live a wicked life and he's a drunkard, do you think God's just going to be blessing him and rewarding him and taking care of him in that sense? Of course not. This is talking about... Uh, you, obviously a man that's saved and that's living according to the law. He's walking in the, in, the, in the commandments of the law. That's what this is talking about. So if you try to use some example of some kid in India, number one, he's not even saved. He's, the, you know, the, the, his parents are probably Hindus, number one. Right. And his dad's not even you know, walking in the commandments. Do you see how when you look, think about these examples how bad and stupid they are and they do not fit at all? I believe the Bible, not man. And I believe that if a, if a man lives by, if he's a saved man and he lives by the commandments and, and he lives a righteous life according to keeping the law and the righteousness uh, that, that, that man can attain to in that sense, I believe that the, he will not be forsaken and his seed will not beg bread. Amen. I believe the Bible. That's why. That's, do, you, do you see how simple that is? Because I believe the Bible. I'm not going to logic this out. I'm not going to think about it. And if you're going to try to tell me that there's a way in which this is not true, I don't want to listen to you. And I don't want to hear it. I believe what the Bible says. So, what should we, in the sense of finances, what should we do? We should, that, shouldn't, that should be irrelevant. You should keep the commandments. The other point is this, and this is also a logical fallacy. And I'm going to explain to you how, and I'm sure you'll understand that. Just because you can have children does not mean that you should have children. Now, this is a logical fallacy, and the reason why is because it's a malformed assertion. Does everyone understand what that means? The, the assertion is malformed. There is a, 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 it's, there's a preconceived idea that causes you to make the statement. Malformed means it's formed incorrectly because you're ignoring something else. That's basically what, what I'm saying. Okay? It, that's irrelevant as well. That's basically what it comes down to. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Well, that's... Because what people will say is this. If you're maybe not familiar with this, people will say, well, you know, and this is what I believe. If you're fertile, you should have children. If you have the ability, you should have children. That's what I believe. If you have the ability, you should have children. And somebody would use the example of like, you know, maybe just like sowing seed. You know, just because you can doesn't mean it's always a good idea, right? The land's fertile, it's ready, but, you know, just because you can doesn't mean it should. You know what that's doing again? It's ignoring the command. Think about that. You're ignoring the command. So if we have already established that we are told to be fruitful and multiply, if you can have children, you should. Do you understand that? How, there was a logical fallacy there? So, so this is what we would start with. Can you have children? Yes. Are you commanded to have children? Yes. Should you have children? Yes. Why? Because of the commandment. Because you're commanded to be fruitful and you're commanded to multiply. Now, are there some women that can't have children? Yeah, there's some women that can, and they're not able to do that. They're not able to keep that commandment. God judges on a curve, and this actually kind of falls into, I'm going to skip a point here. 
a few points and then I'll come back to the other two. I have two other ones. So I want you to think about this. If, what if someone has no legs and no eyes? Is it a commandment to go soul winning? Is it a commandment to go soul winning? Just in general. Okay. Now can that man go soul winning? Let's say that there's somebody who's a vegetable. They're commanded to go soul winning, right? It's just in general. Now God judges on a curb, right? Is God going to, you know, I wanted to preach a sermon about this. So I don't want to go deep, too deep into it because this is how the Bible works and how God works. Is God going to hold that against that man? He's a vegetable. No. Of course not. If you can't have children, well then obviously you can't have children. Now, can that man go soul winning in that sense? Is he, does he have the, the ability to go soul winning? He does not. Now, if he had legs and if, if he had eyes, should he go soul winning? Yes. Do you, are you understanding the parallel that I'm developing right now? If you're fertile, you're given a commandment to, to have children. Just like that guy's given a commandment to go soul winning. If one day he had his eyes operated on and he could see and he was given some prosthetic legs and he starts walking around, if he has the ability, go soul winning. If you have the ability to keep the commandments of God, keep the commandments of God. That, that, that statement, just because you can doesn't mean you should, ignores the, the whole commandment. It's, it's ignoring, it's not addressing the commandment at all. Before I get to any of the fertile and stuff like that, I want to know what the commandment is. Because if I can keep the commandment, I'm going to keep the commandment. Do you see how it's now, how, what I'm explaining when I say it's a malformed assertion? You're avoiding the command. You're making a commandment or a, you're making a statement, I'm sorry, or a declaration without addressing the commandment itself. It's a malformed assertion. This is the next point. Being fruitful and multiplying is an open-ended commandment. It's an open-ended commandment. And I'll explain this to you further as well. This is the point I forgot to put actually in my notes. It's an open-ended commandment like going soul winning. Is there ever a time where it's like, hey, I went soul winning enough. I kept that commandment. I went soul winning last week. I don't need to go soul winning anymore. It's open-ended. Are you ever told to stop? No. Is there ever a time when you're told to stop going soul winning? So think about this, everyone, in your own mind. Do you know what you understand? It's an indefinite command. There's never a time to stop going soul winning, correct? Right. Why? Because he just says, go ye, th go, into, into, go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You know what you understand? I'm just going to go preach the gospel. And you understand that I should just keep doing that, right? Do you know what the Bible says? Be fruitful and multiply. Are you ever told how many kids to have? Do you know why? Because you should just have as many as you can. There's a reason why you get to a point and you can't have them anymore. Because you're not going to be able to take care of them after that age. We, God created the world. It's all perfect. Because there's going to be a certain age, when you have your last kid at 45, you know about the time when you're not going to be able to take care of your kids anymore? About 65. Do you see how, And you know, that's, doesn't that just work out perfectly? You know, and, and uh, you know, the same thing goes for, I can't remember the technical term for it, but like when a woman, when a woman, while a woman is breastfeeding, you know, the, and, and there are exceptions to this. Apparently, you know, with my family, you know, while a woman is breastfeeding, he caught that quick. While a woman is, is breastfeeding, the majority of women will not get pregnant. That's the majority. Now, there are exceptions like, you know, we had an exception this time. You know, you know we practice this. There are exceptions. Normally, and, and, and I believe that that is, has to do with, you know, the chemicals and things like that. But while that cycle is going, you should have children. The Bible even, even teaches this. It talks about in the book of Hosea, I believe it is, when, when he was weaned at two years old. You know, or it doesn't tell you the exact age. I want to get to that point. I want to talk about because I'm tying this in with how creation is perfect. All of this is, 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 is set out. There's a time when a woman can have children... There's a time of the month when she can have children. There's a short cycle. Uh, 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 there's a micro and a macro, right, within her life. And then also she has the cycle monthly and everything. And then the cycle's broken while she has that child. And it's not healthy to have children back to back like that. That's why God, while you're breastfeeding, prevents the cycle. Preventing eggs from being released and obviously eggs that cannot be fertilized and later on develop and, and, or in, at that point exactly develop in a life and then a child that's born later, right? So... You know, this is all laid out perfectly into creation. And here's another thing, too. I was talking to my wife about this. I want you to think about this. When does a child have all of its teeth? 
When, he's, when does he first get all of his teeth? Now people de debated like, well, when should you stop breastfeeding? Because that's when you're going to stop, that's when you're going to wean and that's when you're going to be able to get pregnant. When is it uh, roughly? 15, 16 months? 17 months? When you have teeth, you know what you can do? See how perfect creation is when you just start thinking about it? You can eat food solids. You know, and it can start hurting the wife at that point while the baby's breastfeeding. So you know what that means? It's time. It's time to stop breastfeeding right around that time. Because now he's ready to move on to solid foods. And, he's, and he doesn't need to breastfeed anymore. And that is, if even if you look at doctors, they say that it's like one and a half, two years when you should stop breastfeeding. Because it's time to move on to solids. So you know what at that time is going to begin again? Your cycle. You know what should happen? You should have children. It's an open-ended commandment. Be fruitful and multiply. How many kids are you supposed to have? Well, everybody's going to... And you're not given a number because everybody will have a different amount of kids. Everyone, depending on when they get married, depending on, you know, all different types of factors. I'm not going to go all over, the over all the factors, but everyone's aware of there are numerous factors. But you know what you should do? You should bring forth abundantly. You should be fruitful and multiply. You should wax exceeding mighty. You should, you know, somebody should look at you and say, you have an abundance of children. Look at the abundance of children that you have. That would show to me like, man, I'm being fruitful and multiplying. Seriously. I'm being fruitful and multiplying. Somebody actually said that to me? That'd be, you know, that would mean that you are keeping the commandments. That's what it means. Should have, are you ever told to stop? Is there ever a time where the Bible says, hey, you should prevent? Hey, you should wait? Hey, you should do this? Is there ever an example in the entire Bible where the Bible says limit the amount of children, children that you have ever? The only time is a negative example. The only time. It's never talked about, but you know what you are commanded over and over again? Be fruitful and multiply. Look at some of the people in the Bible and how many children they had. David had 19 kids. Obviously, a few of them by different women. One woman, he had six kids. But do you know still what he understood? I'm going to have an abundance of children. I'm gonna, one guy, uh, I think it's uh, Gideon, isn't it? Had 70 kids. Uh, you know, that's polygamy, obviously. You know, he's having multiple wives. But he, even still, he understood that he was, he was at least keeping that commandment, even though he was avoiding other you know, commandments and sinning terribly against the Lord there. He knew, I'm going to have as many kids as possible. Abraham, even in his old age, had six kids. He's like 120 when he married Keturah. You know what that shows you? He wasn't using contraceptives. He wasn't limiting the amount of children he had. It's just the natural way of life. It's the natural practice of just having children. You have to, you know, it's unnatural to limit. The, the, the natural practice is you just have the kids. And that's just what happens from the relationship. From the physical act and the physical relationship, the kids just come about. You have to interfere into God's creation and into God's uh, design in order to stop the kids. In some way or another, and I don't know what you're doing or, or, or what you would do, but you would have to interfere into that. You'd have to step in and intervene. Right. Now, does it make sense that, that, that God wants you, if He never mentions it, if He never talks about it, but the only commands that are given are abundance, exceeding, brief fruit from multiply, the examples of people doing it, and when God says they're, they're keeping it, or people having as many as they should? Does it make sense on top of all of that? And then on top of the fact that we can see clearly that the, the way in which creation is supposed to you know, uh, take place, that you should step in and try to do things yourself? No. You should just go about it naturally. You should just keep the commandment. It's an open-ended commandment. Like, going so, like studying the Bible. Think about that. I forgot to put all this in my notes, but like studying the Bible. You know, are you going to, what if a guy got saved at 40? He studies the Bible for 10 years. Is he good? Studied the Bible for 10 years. And I'm just going to set back. I kept that commandment. I studied. I mean, you can't say I didn't study. I, I personally used to not believe this doctrine. I for, this is, I know you guys probably forget about this because we all met at Faithful Word or Brother Anthony. You know, everybody normally, when they met and when they got serious with their Christianity, was at Faithful Word, Brother Anthony, right before that, before he came here. I served God devoutly for like four years, like in a ministry as a, you know, I, I, was, I was running ministries, preaching behind the pulpit multiple times. Before I ever even heard the name Stephen Anderson, I had my own views from my own independent study on this. You know how many kids I was going to have? Four. 
Do you know why? Because my pastor preached and was a big advocate of be fruitful and multiply. And you know what he thought that meant? And he was dead serious, wasn't he, Jessica? I have two kids. Or I, I'm, I, there's two of us, me and my wife. I multiplied. What's two times two? Four. He was dead serious. That's four kids. And I believe that. And when I heard somebody preaching the opposite, it offended me. And it pricked me in the heart. And I went and studied it, and I still was like, nope, that's wrong, and what I believe now is right. But do you know why I said that? Because I've studied it deeper, and I eventually came around, but do you know why I said that even at that point? Do you, do you know why for me, do you know why for almost everybody, convenience. Convenience. That's what it comes down to. Convenience. Why? Is it difficult to take care of a lot of kids? Yes. Is it difficult to, you know, have to, to, have to make all the money, you know, to support a ton of kids? Yes. It's difficult. It's difficult. But it's a blessing, right? It's a blessing from God. Do you know why? Why do people, why do people get abortions? Why do they choose at the end, I don't want that child? Convenience. Do you know why people choose not to have it at all? It's not any different. Convenience. It's convenience. That's what it comes down to. It's convenience. Hey, life is hard, my friend. Life is hard. Life is hard for the female. Life is hard for the male. It's both of us. It's not just the female. You know, and oftentimes that's where this comes from. It's, it's, this, it's where the, 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 the woman feels overwhelmed and you know, she feels like she's just not able to take care of all the kids. But it's hard on the man's side too. The man has to make all the money. Here, you know, I don't want a pity party. I don't want people to feel sorry for me at all. And the only reason why I'm bringing this up is as an example. Do you know what my schedule looks like for a week? You know, you're probably ignorant of this, but let me explain to you my schedule for a week. I go to work at 7 a.m. I get off at 4 p.m. I read my Bible. I eat. I get a shower. I literally probably have 20 minutes to spend with my family. I go soul winning. I come back. I spend about 30 minutes with my family. They go to bed. I get up the next day. I do the exact same thing. 7. You know what, how, what time I got off this Tuesday? 8.30. I got home, spent a little, maybe a half an hour with my family, went to sleep. They went to sleep. I had about an hour to read my Bible, went to sleep. Got up on Wednesday, came to, you know, go to work on Wednesday. Worked 7 to 4.30 on Wednesday, okay? I went to work until 4.30. I came home. I literally tell Jessica, have all the kids ready, make sure everything's ready, the food's on the table. I half the time don't even eat dinner on Wednesdays. I get home, I take a shower, I leave and come to the church, and I'm in the office by usually 5, 30, 6 o'clock to write my sermon for Wednesday night. Sometimes I have like 20 minutes. This past week, I stayed up until midnight so that I, I, wrote, I wrote part of my sermon from 11 till midnight. And then I had from 5, 30 till 7 to finish writing my sermon for Wednesday night. Then on Thursday, there was a reason why my truck was here Thursday. Do you know why? Because I worked from 7 to 5. And then I got here at 5.30. And then, guess what we had at 6 o'clock? Christmas caroling. So I spent, Jessica brought me my food. I ate my food in the office. I got on the computer, tried to find somewhere to go to for the Christmas caroling. Friday, I'm totally blanking on Friday. I worked 7 to 4.15. I worked 7 to 4.15. I went home. I wrote this sermon. From probably about, you know, uh, I don't know, 5 to maybe, you know, 7 o'clock or something like that. I think that's right. I don't even remember what I did on Friday. I wrote this sermon. Saturday, I worked from 7 to uh, 11.15. 7 to 11.15. Went home, got a shower, got ready, came down to the church. Went soul winning from 12 to 2 o'clock. Came home, finished writing this, or came to the church, finished writing the sermon from 2 o'clock until about 5 o'clock. I left and went and filled up the jugs for the week, for the, the Christmas caroling, and picked up uh, uh, something, all oh, the pizzas, brought it back. The time that I get to socialize is with you guys when we eat food and hang out. You know, 
here's the thing. I don't, I, I don't want a pity party from you. I don't want you to say, oh, I'm so sorry you don't have time to spend with your family. Do you know what I want you to do? Is to realize that life is difficult for both of us. For the, I'm not into this, you know, just giving all this sympathy in this feminist society to the woman at all. What happens is the man's sacrifice is totally ignored and life is so hard for the ladies. Life is so hard for the women. Both of our lives are hard. But do you hear me crying about it? Do you know the only time I ever bring that up is to prove a point to you. Life is difficult. Quit being a baby. Grow up. Life is hard for me. Life is hard for you. Life is work. Life is hard. Life is stressful. You know, here's the thing. I love my wife to death, but my life, she'll tell you. Whose life is harder, mine or yours? Is it even comparison? Not even close. Hey, it's hard to take care of kids. It's, it's difficult. Life is difficult. Life is hard. Do you know why I wanted to have four kids? A big part of it? Convenience. Not stupid. I knew my life would be a whole lot easier if I only had four kids. That's why. And then I studied out the Bible myself, and you know what? I ended up coming to the conclusion. I heard Stephen Anderson's preaching on it the first time I heard it, and I had heard other people preach about it. I rejected it. Then I came and I studied, and you'll notice that the things that I believe about it, and the reason why I can, I can articulate the definition is because I defined these words for myself, and I tried to figure out what is it actually telling me and what is it actually teaching me. So even by the, before I had moved to Faithful Word, I succumbed to the truth of the Bible that I'm going to die and I have 14 kids probably. <laughs> you know? And you know what? I got to the point where I was happy about it. I can't imagine not having as many kids as I, as I can. Amen. I'm looking forward to having as many kids as I can. I want to have as many children as I possibly can. You know why I work hard and all that stuff? is for my family. You know why I do a lot of things I do? is for the church. That's what I do, the things that I do. You know, when I stand around here with you guys and socialize, that's my only time not working. Period. When Brother Hall comes into my office and I start talking to Brother Hall, I just stopped working and now I'm socializing. And you know, this is the time that I get to socialize for a few minutes. For that time until church starts. From that time until they come out here and start practicing. Hey, I'm not wanting you to feel sorry for me. I'm not trying to boast and to brag. What I'm trying to say is, do you hear me crying and complaining about this crap? When I'm sitting over here and you know I just got off of work or something like that, half the time you don't even know it. You have no clue. You have no idea what my schedule looks like. Life is hard. Life is difficult. Life is about work. That's what it's about. Life is about work. We are put here to work. We're put here to work for the Lord is what we're put here for. We're put here to do work for God. That's what we should be, you know, doing, put, spending our time on. Right. Life is about working. And, and women taking care of the children. It's work. It's hard work. Yeah. I don't complain. Neither should my wife. And hey, are there times where she breaks down and stuff and I have to tell her to shut up? No, I'm just kidding. Are there times when she's having a hard time and I let her vent? Yeah, of course. And she's like, I just can't handle this anymore. And do I kind of take over with the kids and stuff? Yes. And that's okay. You should do that. I, we do that. Are there times when, when she's just like about to mentally snap? Yes. Yes. You know, it's difficult staying home with the kids. I understand that. And if I did, we'd probably have two kids today instead of six. You know, it's hard to stay home with the kids. And, God, and, and you know, men, and I'm not, I know that I, maybe I'm wired a little, maybe it's, you know, so it's the same. You know, it's, I can't, I can't do it for over like an hour or two hours. Like, I start like, like losing my stinking mind. You know, I can't do it. If it's just me and there's nobody else and Jesse's not there, I start going crazy. Men and women are different. We're not the same. Women are like, and she's just like, kids are like banging toys in the background, throwing crap against the wall, kicking stuff. And Jesse's like, mm -hmm. I'm like, are you kidding me right now? Go get that stinking kid. And spank his butt. I, and, and it's just, I hear it in the back of my mind like it's like inside of my brain throwing stuff around in my head. Men and women are different. Right? You know, is it hard work? Is it difficult? Yes. It's hard. It's difficult. It is. For me and for you. 
Both should be making sacrifices. Both should be working hard. You know, but what it comes down to is this. What are the commandments of God? All of that's irrelevant. How difficult my life is, is irrelevant. How hard, how hard it's going to be to provide for possibly 14 kids. You know, I think we pace it out at 12, but now because of what happened, maybe 13. So, is that going to be difficult? Yeah. Do I need to earn more money now? Am I going to have to make more money as time goes on? Yeah. You know what I could say? Let's just limit a couple. Let's just not have, you know, a couple here, a couple there. But you know what matters? What does the commandment say? What does the Bible say? That's what matters. So what does it mean to be fruitful and multiply? Replenish the earth. Fill the earth. Bring forth abundantly. Wax exceeding mighty. When we see the children of Israel fulfilling it, what are they doing? They're not limiting the amount of kids that they have. It's an open-ended commandment. You know what you need to do? You need to bring forth abundantly. You need to be fruitful and multiply. You need to have as many kids as God gives you. You need to have as many kids as God gives you. You need to be fruitful and multiply. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you, dear God, for the clarity of it. When we dig deeper, we can uh, come to more precision and more precise conclusions on what the commandment means and what the spirit of it is and the examples that were given in the Bible of how many children and, 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 and then comparing it unto other open-ended commandments, dear Lord. We, we just thank you that we can come to clarity, that we don't have one page that you gave us, but we can compare Scripture with Scripture. There's so many examples that you want us to understand it. Help us, dear God, to, to keep your commandments, to, to put all things in life aside, to make sure that, that the law of the Lord has precedence, precedence in our life, that we would love you and that we would do what's right in your eyes. We love you so much and in Jesus Christ's name, amen.